Well, the snow helped, didn't it? I mean, getting you in the Christmas spirit. Maybe you, like I, even prayed that the snow would visit us again on Christmas Eve. The thought of a white Christmas kind of yanks at my heart, that sentimental sort of nature um, that comes to me during this season. In the church, it is not yet the Christmas season, for we are in Advent. Both are times of anticipation. In the broader culture, like in the church, this is a time of waiting and hoping. But it, in the church, we do not wait and hope for some surprise gift or perfect present or get excited about a visit from out of town relatives, even though all those might be wonderful. The waiting and hoping that we do in the church moves way beyond the commercial and the sentimental. Advent requires us to go deeper. Advent is a time for self-reflection and even, yes, a time for repentance. The preparation we make as Christians during this season has little to do with planning, shopping, decorating, airport runs or menus. For us, each year, in this season, the child has not yet come. And our focus is on preparing ourselves, our hearts, bodies, minds, souls, and spirits, so that we won't miss out on the depth of the gift that we are being given when Christmas Eve and Christmas Day arrive. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, preaching in the 12th century, speaks of the idea of the three advents of Christ. The first one of these is the one in which Christ entered into the world, having received his human nature in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The second advent is the one that we use in the creed, where Christ will come at the end of time to judge the living and the dead. But the second advent is the one that we understand, or Bernard did anyway, that is taking place at every moment in our earthly life as wayfarers. Thomas Merton, a 20th century mystic, writing about St. Bernard's three advents, says this about the second advent. We awaken to the fact that every moment of time is a moment of judgment, that Christ is passing by, and that we are judged by our own awareness of his passing. If we join him and travel with him to the kingdom, the judgment becomes our salvation. But if we neglect him and let him go by, our neglect is our condemnation. This season is our second advent, wherein we are given the opportunity to increase our awareness of God's presence, our awareness of ourselves, our own limitations, and the times we have sinned and missed the mark. Advent, in fact, is one of two major seasons in the church year when we dare to pause and take a look take stock, confess to a loving God, make a 180 degree turnaround, ask for help, seek forgiveness, make restitution, and accept absolution. I dare say that no one sitting in these pews this morning, certainly not the person standing in the pulpit and probably not the folks up here in the chancel, that there isn't even a Christian anywhere in the world no human being alive who could not benefit from the throes and the disciplines of this season. Unless we are quite simply sociopaths, we all carry what I call good guilt. Good guilt is appropriate remorse for the ways in which we individually and or collectively often quite naturally and unintentionally, have hurt other human beings. Good guilt 
emanates from the reservoir of common pathos shared by all human beings. I read an article this week in The Atlantic about the death of a fraternity pledge at Penn State in 2015 as a result of hazing practices. Besides the obvious violation of university and fraternity policies regarding such behaviors, the appalling truth that was revealed in this article was that this young man struggled for his life for almost 18 hours while other brothers around him were more focused on themselves and clearly placed their own need to appear not guilty above his well-being and his life. We can all agree that there is something wrong when human beings can watch other human beings struggle for life and do nothing. The testimonies at the Nuremberg trials in the last century revealed such callousness. Thousands of accounts of rape victims by Boko Haram in Africa today reveal our capacity to use other human beings and to be numb to anything except our own pleasure. And in our own country, the current thinking in Congress, not to renew CHIP, the Child Health Care Initiative, in favor of tax cuts for people like us, says much the same about us and our callousness. Good guilt is in a fact for a life that is worthy of our creator. The guilt is good precisely because it shows that we have a conscience. Now, if deeply explored, good guilt also shows that we have a need for repentance and forgiveness. And ultimately, I think it shows that we have a deep need for God, for the higher power, for the Holy One, who knows us and loves us anyway, and gives us a pathway through the guilt to freedom and peace. A 60-year-old woman came to me years ago for spiritual direction, seeking my help as an advisor in her prayer life. Over a, a, a year of monthly meetings and supportive prayer, it became clear that she carried a lot of guilt. She was trying to distinguish between appropriate guilt, the kind that comes from an honest assessment of one's life, and unnecessary guilt, that unresolved, nagging sense that stayed with her, as if something were wrong with her at her core. What became clear in a retreat wherein we focused on her sense of something being fundamentally wrong with her were two things. The weight she carried of her childhood experience of her judgmental father and the memory of an incident wherein she had been taken advantage of sexually by a boss in the workplace. The good guilt she could handle. She was actually, she actually had this piercing sense of her own self, a kind of assessment that was, and her desire to be a better person that distinguished her. It was the bad guilt that eluded her because in fact, it had nothing to do with her. Through prayer, she gained the strength to relive her experiences with her father and her boss who both of whom by then were already dead. She was able, with God's help, to understand and forgive them. It was then that she was freed. She learned to distinguish between the penalties she had allowed to be placed on her, the bad guilt, and the ones that were genuinely her own, the good guilt. Like in Isaiah's lesson today, when God spoke tenderly to God's people. In that lesson, Isaiah broke ranks with other prophets and said to the people who wanted to return to Jerusalem, you don't need, I love you, you do not need to keep paying for some sin, some sin of just being human. In the process, because God spoke tenderly to her, her awareness grew, and she was 
in essence, traveling the path of the Second Advent. You know, race relations in the U.S. are complicated. Many have referred to slavery as our original sin, and that would imply in Christian theology that racism that is still experienced in this land cannot be overcome except by God's help and saving grace. And while I believe that may actually be true, I prefer to think of slavery as a communal sin, very much of our own doing, um, quite properly uh, a sin that evokes good guilt. It is not something that we had nothing to do with. It is something we need to examine and claim. It is a current reality that requires that we be in relationship with those who have suffered, be in relationship in an honest way so that repentance can be true and bold and forgiveness can heal us all. There was this married couple living outside of Chicago in the 50s. The husband was Jewish and the wife was Christian. And they were progressive by nature and because of their experience of being a mixed religion couple, they were a little different. The suburban development they lived in had struggled with the issue of integration and they had sided with the folks who wanted to allow blacks to purchase homes in their development. But the community had voted differently. Now, they had had two adopted sons, and so they wanted to adopt a daughter, and following all the necessary legal steps, they anticipated the arrival of their new little girl in April 1962. And when she was brought to their home, they were surprised to see that she was black. The Jewish father immediately was reminded of the cross burnings and the racist taunts that had recently erupted in their neighborhood. The couple was split on whether or not to keep her this new daughter. After a great deal of angst, they returned the child and a few months later adopted a little white girl whom they named Amy. At about age 10, Amy's brothers, teasing her, revealed that the, fa the family secret about the other sister that they had had for a short while. Years and years passed and after the Trayvon Martin incident in Florida, Amy decided to search for the other sister. She prevailed and found her. Her name was Angel. They eventually met. Their story is one that defies the stereotypes of whether or not it is better to be raised in a black family or a white family in the US. They both had had their struggles and their graces in life. But what was especially touching was that Amy's father was still alive when the two women came to know each other and he had an opportunity to meet Angel also. At their meeting in a restaurant in La Jolla, California, Angel ran toward him and embraced him, whispering in his ear, thank you very much. Surprised, almost taken aback, he asked why she was thanking him. And she replied, I don't know if you've battled with this over the years, but you did the right thing. And by her own account, he seemed visibly relieved. And Jill said, I watched 50 years of guilt and shame roll off him. By all accounts and on video, Michael T. Slager, a white South Carolina police officer, killed Walter Scott, an unarmed black man, shooting him five times after he had pulled him over for a broken brake light. And after fighting the charges for two years, Slager finally pled guilty to violating Scott's civil rights, while two other charges were dropped. He was convicted in May, and this week he was sentenced sentenced. He was given 20 years. The judge said that his sentencing had included consideration of Slager's reckless, wanton, and inappropriate shooting of Scott. Slager had admitted his guilt. He said to the court, Walter Scott is no longer with his family, and I am responsible for that. I wish it never would have happened. I wish I could go back in time. And then later in the hearing, Michael Scott's mother, excuse me, 
Walter Scott's mother, Judy, said, looked at Slater and said, I forgive you and I pray for you that you will repent and let Jesus come into your life. Just as you are, he will forgive you. Mr. Slager mouthed the words, I'm sorry. And Mrs. Scott nodded her set head and said, I know. While by the world's standards, Michael Slager will suffer in prison, by the standards of our faith, he has traveled far with Jesus, as Merton would say, as a wayfarer on the way to the kingdom. Sometimes the soul is more important than the body, and judgment can come as salvation. This is a time of anticipation, of waiting and hoping. But most of all here in the church, unlike in the world, it is a time of deep reflection. It is not that Santa is going to give you coal in your stocking if you're not a good boy or a good girl. Our discussion in the church goes much deeper than that. It assumes that we are not just good boys and girls, women and men. It assumes that we are on a journey. We are not perfect and that at our core, we are in need of correction. We need God's help. We can sometimes distinguish between good guilt and bad guilt, and sometimes it is more complicated. But guilt is real and we all carry it. So we need this time of self-reflection and repentance. And so, coming soon to a church near you is this God who cannot stand to be far away, far away from you, wants to be with you in all of your life, not just as a passerby, but as a companion on the way. And so in this Advent season, we humbly await God's coming again this year. Amen. <laughs>